Chris Hipkins. Thank you very much, Mr Chair. And I want to thank the Minister for her contribution to the debate earlier uh, when she addressed some but not all of the questions and issues that members had raised. And in particular, the question that she did not address around principals managing more than one school is how a principal, what the, what the employment relationship would be. So would the principal be reporting to one board of trustees on behalf of a number of boards? How would that actually work? And the Minister didn't address that. She also didn't address what would happen if the relationship with one of the uh, school's boards of trustees and the principal broke down, but the others, uh, but the others were happy to, with, to continue with the arrangement. What would happen to the employment relationship in those circumstances? And she didn't actually address those issues. And, and to me, that, comes, that cuts to the heart of a lot of the concerns I have about it. How is this actually going to work? And the minister talked about, uh, in her um, contribution, about an area school and, and drew an analogy with an area, an area school. There's a difference. There's two essential differences with an area, an, an area school, one of which uh, is that they're governed by a single board of trustees, and the second of which is that they're all typically geographically located on one site. Whereas what we're talking about with this change is that a principal could be managing a number of schools in different geographic locations with different boards of trustees. Uh, and with different pressures on them. And I want to understand how that's actually going to work in terms of the employment relationship, which was not an issue that the Minister addressed. We then uh, come to the issue uh, which hasn't yet been canvassed, and that is the uh, supplementary order paper introduced by the Minister after the public hearings process had been completed by the Select Committee that introduced an entirely new category of teacher called trainee teacher. And the provision that this bill puts in place is it gives the minister power to require a school to create a teaching position called a trainee teacher that they could only appoint somebody to who was uh, ta uh, taking part in one of the teacher training programs. And this would be, uh, and, and there is no guarantee that this position would be in addition to rather than instead of one of the positions that they currently get within their teaching allocation. Now, that would be one of the issues where, if the government were to give, were to give me that, that assurance, I, I would say I'm, I'm open to the debate because I think that there's a huge scope for more on-job training for teachers, and that's certainly the feedback that principals give, and actually a lot of the initial teacher education providers themselves acknowledge this. But if, that, if those trainee teachers are going to replace teachers who are fully qualified and already in the classroom, and that creates a concern. It also creates a concern that there don't seem to be any restrictions around uh, how widely this will be applied. So, for example, there is an evidence base around Teach First, and the evidence base is largely positive. It's been evaluated by NZCER, and the evaluation came out positive. They only deal with secondary school teachers. The, the relationship in a primary school would be very, very different, and yet there's no restriction uh, that would prevent a, a, a one of these trainee teachers replacing a primary school teacher. And so there are really big issues around the supplementary order paper as drafted by the Minister, and, and as presented by the Minister, and as now incorporated into the Bill, that haven't been adequately canvassed. And so. I, have, I want to be really clear. I think that, there are, uh, that we need to do a much better job of initial teacher education in New Zealand, and that there should be a larger on-job practical component to initial teacher education, because that is what a lot of the experts working in this area have been saying, and we should certainly take note of that. And there is goodwill within the educational community to addressing that issue and to actually creating some practical solutions. But what this uh, legislative amendment does is it potentially uh, tears away all of that goodwill. We uh, managed to negotiate with the government an extension of the time frame for the report back of this bill so that the Select Committee, committee could have one week to hear submissions from uh, people who, were, who had an interest in this particular area. They didn't have time to adequately prepare their, I mean, uh, their submissions, uh, but we did at least, as a select committee, have an opportunity to hear from them, and they were overwhelmingly opposed to it. And even those uh, who were, but, but even those who were within the group of people who were opposed, there was some support for some of the concepts contained within the supplementary order paper, but they were concerned that they were being rushed, that they were being poorly thought through, and that they didn't have the evidence base to, to back them up that they needed to in order for people to be able 
able to support them. This is quite a significant issue because this, uh, this bill, that, that, this, that part of the bill has not been through the parliamentary process that it should have gone through. It's almost akin to passing it under urgency because it is not going to get the proper select committee scrutiny that it should have received, uh, although it is not being passed. Mr Chairman. Paul Foster Bill. I move that the question oh, be Mr. now Mr Chairman. Chair. 